Good morning. It's good to see you all on such a soggy Sunday. They're raising the shades on the windows and you can't tell the difference. <laughs> That's all right. We're concluding our series today on, uh, it's called Surprised by Grace, and we've been looking, this will be the eighth week into the life of Moses. Uh, a lot of people, when they think about Moses, they just think about law and judgment. But the story of Moses is just filled with amazing pictures of grace, and we've been looking at this, uh, uh, God calling Moses. It's a, that's an act of grace. A lot of us feel we're unqualified or disqualified, and yet God calls us, that's, that's grace. And then, and then God provides more than one opportunity to change our hearts and our minds. Is there anybody else in the house glad that God gives us more than one chance? It's just amazing, right? That's grace. And then God's judgment is limited. If God's judgment was not limited, then everything imperfect would be incinerated, and that's not how God operates. And so we learned about that, and then we learned that God rescues us from forces that are greater than us, just by his grace, not because we've earned it. God provides food and rest. Uh, I know Thanksgiving has been a little bit of ways, but how many appreciated the food that you got on Thanksgiving? Yeah. How many have completely avoided the scale? Just, yeah. Okay. And then God provides also refreshing in hard and dry places. And, and, and God tabernacles with us. He dwells with us. He lives with us. That's an act of his grace. And today we're going to look at God heals us from the consequences of sin. And I have to warn you up front, this is one of the stranger stories in the entire Old Testament. And, uh, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, just be prepared. You're going to be offended by it. <coughs> Numbers chapter 21, verse 4, it says... Israel traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. In case you're wondering what that was, that was manna that God had provided for them every day. Then the Lord sent, this is where it gets uh, hard to talk about and hard to explain. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them and they bit the people and many Israelites died. Well, there you go. That's what happens when you complain about the food. It just... <laughs> The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake, put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked on the bronze snake, they lived. Well, it would be easier for me if we just said, let's go home now, because I got to talk about this. Uh, by this point in Israel's journey, a lot of Bible scholars believe that they're at least three decades into their journey, over 30 years. Some uh, Bible scholars think 38 years by this point of this incident. And this story really is quite uncomfortable and uh, difficult to explain, and seems as though God is overreacting. They complained about the food, and God says, fine, I'll send venomous snakes in, and they'll bite you. And uh, so let's, let's get a little bit of the context of the story first. They're having to go around Edom. This is really interesting because uh, uh, Edom had a major trade route that went through it, and it's the direction that Israel needs to go. And uh, so they sent emissaries to the king of Edom and said, we'd like to pass through Edom on this major trade route. And the king of Edom said, no. And th so they, they sent back another thing. They said, look, we'll only stay on the trade route. We will not go to the left or right. We won't eat anything. We won't take anything. If our animals wander off and accidentally eat some of your grass, we'll pay for it. And the king of Edom said, no. And he sent out his army and he said, if you try to go this way, we will slaughter you. That's a hard no. And so uh, now Israel is having to go a very more difficult journey and a lot longer around. And what's interesting about Edom is these are actually distant relatives of Israel. 
It goes back to, so the name Israel comes from the person Jacob, and Jacob had his name changed by God to Israel. These are the descendants. Israel are the descendants of Jacob. Jacob had a brother. His name was Esau. Edom are the descendants of Esau. And Jacob and Esau didn't get along so good most of their lives. And it looks like their descendants aren't doing a lot better. And so the king refused. Now they have to go the long way around and, and people are getting impatient. 30 years. I mean, just think about it. If you, had, if you were going somewhere and you're 30 years into the journey and now you're having to take another detour, would you become impatient? And here's the thing about our impatience. We tend to act a little differently when we're impatient. We're at risk when we are impatient. Israel grew impatient. There's a way we sound, there's a way we talk, there's an economy of speech, there's an edge to our tone, there's decisions that we will consider that ordinarily we wouldn't think of. So they spoke against God, and they spoke against Moses. And once again, they accused them of an attempt at genocide. You've brought our entire nation out here to kill us in the wilderness. And then they said this, there's no bread. Now, they, they were getting manna, I'll get to that in a minute, but on, on the bread side of things, you have to realize they came from Egypt, and Egypt had the most sophisticated and, and most varied form of yeast in the entire world at that time. Like, Egypt was the bread center of the planet. Is there anybody here that likes bread? Yeah. And so, like that, so they, they really enjoyed their bread, and they weren't getting any of that, and then they said, there's, there's no water. Well, that's not exactly true. God was creating water, but he was creating water from a single source, which meant there was a lot of effort and a lot of coordination required in order just to get the water that you need. Like, what do you need water for? I mean, we use water for coffee. We use water to drink. We, we use water for bathing. We use water for our pets and our animals. We, like, there's a lot of water for toilets, obviously. Like, there's a lot of ways we use water. Uh, about 30 miles southwest of us, there's a town that's actually going through a problem. Their wells are all drying up. And they have no water. The, the mayor of the town is having to bring in huge amounts of water, and this has created huge inconveniences. So Israel has water that's flowing from a rock, but they, it's a single source. And in Egypt, water was everywhere. It was the Nile River. Like, there's actually a place in the Bible that said all they had to do was take their heel and dig a little ditch and they could get water to flow wherever they wanted it to flow. A place where there was some of the best bread on the planet and water easily accessible and they're tired. They're, they're, they've been inconvenienced. They're impatient and they're not happy about it. And then this is what they say. They say, uh, there's nothing but this detestable food. Well, what made it detestable was that it was the same thing every day. And uh, not only are we at risk, uh, we're, we're at risk when we get bored too. When we get bored, we will consider options we might not have considered. We detest this miserable food. The miserable food they were talking about was life-sustaining. It was keeping them alive. But it was monotonous. It was manna. They had manna for breakfast. They had manna for lunch. They had manna for dinner. If you wanted dessert, guess what it was going to be? There's only so many things you can do with manna. Fry manna, bake manna. Manna on a stick. <laughs> manna cotti. I mean, it's just, you run out of things to do with manna after a while. And uh, so they're getting bored. And they vent their frustration along with accusations against God and against Moses. And God sends, this is the reaction from God, venomous snakes. Just imagine if God sent a venomous snake when you complained. Uh, most of us would not be here. And many people were bitten. And many of those who were bitten died. This is not good. And uh, in case, like, I looked up, what are symptoms of poisonous and venomous snake bites? How many would like to know? Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, here you go. Intense pain at the site of the bite. That's not good. Swelling and redness around the bite area. That's not good. Nausea and vomiting. Not good. 
dizziness or fainting. That's not good. Difficulty breathing. That's not good. Blurred vision. Not good. Excessive sweating. Rapid heartbeat. Muscle weakness. Intense fever. Death. This is not good. And when we read a passage like this, it offends us. It offends us. People who are not part of the Christian family will say things like this. So that's the kind of God you want to serve. You complain about the food and he sends in snakes and bites and if it doesn't make you sick, it kills you. That's really the kind of God you're promoting. Just, it, this is the kind of God who overreacts. And we think, this is, we think we know the best way for everything. We do. Now, history has taught us we actually don't know that much. And if we learn from history, we would know more. But we don't learn from history. We either repeat it or we use it as ammunition against other people. We don't learn from it. So we often put ourselves in God's judgment seat. And if God does less than we want, we consider him apathetic and uncaring. And if God does more than we want, we consider him ruthless and irrational. People are tempted to judge God unless he does what they want how they want, when they want. The problem with humanity is not God. The problem with humanity is that we will only accept a God who always agrees with us. And that is, that's a really rough road to go down. How could a loving God allow? Have you ever heard anybody start a sentence like that? Or how could a loving God judge or punish have you ever heard someone start a, a sentence like that? And we all have different ideas about what God should allow and what God should punish. So who's right? Who gets to decide that? Is it the majority? Like we live in a democracy and, and under a democracy, the majority rules, right? In, in, in a democracy, the minority gets to be heard, but the majority rules. That's, that's kind of how it works or it's supposed to work. So that's the idea, right? It's, so it's majority, is that it? So do we believe that the majority always gets things right? Do we believe we are always right when we're looking at something? Are we always right? Like, I think most people looking at the situation in Egypt with Israel being enslaved by brutal taskmasters for hundreds of years would go, yeah, that's, that's probably wrong. And there are people who would look at our own nation's history and say that the, the years of slavery that existed in our country, that, that's wrong. Like, that should not have happened. So, so let me ask you a question. Is slavery all gone then, since we all agree? Is human trafficking eliminated? There are actually more people enslaved today in human trafficking than all the humans ever put in slavery before today, together. So how's the majority doing? Why don't we stop this? And the answer is because there's far too many people that benefit from it. It's far too dangerous to go after it. The majority may have opinions, but they often tolerate the intolerable. So is that what's going to make the decisions for us about what's right and what's wrong? It's, it's simply the majority. We, our world accommodates and benefits from the way things are. This is happening on our watch. What are we going to do about it? What this passage kind of tells us is that finding fault and blaming someone for the way things are doesn't actually make anything better. And this is what people do. We don't have to fix anything. We just have to find fault with somebody. Oh, look how bad that is. It's their fault. And we consider ourselves, ha, I've done my job. I've identified the fiend, the culprit, the person who should be held accountable. 
And we're going to discover in just a minute that that process actually doesn't work with God. So they actually start taking responsibility. For example, we think human traffic, well, I won't, well, let's just go ahead. This is the easiest question you get all day. All right, how many are opposed to human trafficking? Uh, that's almost everybody. <laughs> wow, opposed to human trafficking. So we can find fault, and we can assign blame, or maybe we could support a ministry like Aki's Place that takes the children of those who are in human trafficking and gives them a safe place to stay and an education and food every day and a set of skills so that they don't have to be caught in the same trap their mothers are caught in. We could do that, and we do that. And our church family, to the tune of thousands of dollars every single year, supports a place like Aki's Place. How many, how many are grateful for that? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or how about in, in inner city Rochester, three out of four homes do not have a father present in it. Three out of four homes. Three out of four homes do not have a father present in it. And the set of, of uh, consequences and, and side effects that that creates, is, it's hard to even calculate or imagine. It would be so easy to say, oh, it's their fault. Oh, this is what's wrong. And we just assign blame. Or, or we could do what two of our elders have done, in, in, in Gary Haydens and Matt Terry, and they've started an organization called Link where they will find men who are willing to be mentors and they will find boys who want to be mentored and they will pair them up so that they can have a positive male influence in their life. Is that not a good thing? Yeah. Or, or we could just blame and criticize and point our fingers. Yeah. Schools, the, 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 the graduation rate of, of inner city school, it's, it's unbelievable. It's hard. It's, it's horrible. And, and we would all be terrified if that was the, the potential our children were facing. And we could complain about, well, who's in charge and who's responsible, what political party and all. Or, or we could pick a school and we could send people down to help kids with their homework and read in the classes and set up their programs. And, and we do that all the time at, at, at uh, Claire Barton School number two. How many think that's a good idea? Yeah. We have, we have lots of people who are opposed to abortion. That's good. We're pro-life. But just finding fault doesn't solve any problems. And so what have we decided to do as a church family? We decided to, call, to start something called adoption assistance. And so on the screen right now is a baby you helped place in someone's home by your contributions. His name is... Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. His name is Johnny, her name is Jessica, and the baby's name is Marcy. Marcy wasn't supposed to be born until December 24th. She came early, but she's healthy, she's strong, and she's in a godly home. Yeah. Once we blame God for the world's problems, we excuse ourselves from taking any action. That's all it takes. And that's what Israel is doing. We're not getting the bread we like. Access to water is too restricted. And all we get is the same monotonous meal every single day. So the question is, what does it take for us to climb down from our positions of arrogance and dismantle our, langu uh, dismantle our language of accusation and blame? What will it take? What does it take to wake us up so that we just don't stay asleep in this dream state of constantly blaming other people and doing nothing about anything. What will it take to wake you up? For Israel, it was venomous snakes. And it's very easy for us to sit in judgment, but they woke up. And, and, and this is what's interesting. They started taking responsibility. We have sinned against God. Res repentance accepts responsibility. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and we spoke against Moses. They take responsibility for their words 
and their actions. As long as you're blaming someone, there's no repentance involved. So yeah, but it wasn't my fault. That's true. A lot of times, many of us have suffered injuries that were not our fault, but now we do have a responsibility. How are we going to react under this situation? They realized that they had brought this on themselves, so they stopped blaming and they started repenting, and that made a huge difference. And so God tells them, tells Moses, I want you to make a snake and put it on a pole. Don't you just get excited about that kind of iconic? Well, you should, because that is the symbol of medicine everywhere in the world today. Where do you think that symbol of a snake on a pole came from? This story. This story, that's where it comes from. There's no other story in human history to describe why that's the symbol of healing. If someone's bitten by a snake, listen, if someone's bitten by a snake, just look at it and you will be healed. This is interesting to me. God did not tell them, catch the snakes, kill the snakes, touch the snakes. How many are glad does not say, God does not say touch the snakes? Just not interested in that at all. What does he say? Look and live. So why? This, this is really fascinating to me because we all want to be forgiven for our faults and failures. I don't know anyone who wants to carry around the kind of guilt that comes with every mistake and misdeed we've ever done. And grace provides that. That's an essential part of God's grace, but it's incomplete. If all you are settling for, if all you are searching for is in forgiveness, you have settled for an incomplete gospel. God wants to do so much more than that. He doesn't just want to forgive. He wants to heal what has been broken by our sins, what has been infected by our sins, what is being ruined by our sins. And this is a really interesting thing. This is the only place you find this story. Sometimes stories show up multiple places in Scripture. This is the only place you find this story in all of Scripture. It's not even included in the book of Exodus, only in the book of Numbers. But it shows up one other time. There was a Jewish ruler. His name was Nicodemus, and he'd gone to see Jesus at night because he didn't want other people to see that he was talking to this man. And he told Jesus, when I see what you're doing and I hear what you're saying, I know you're from God, but I really don't understand you at all. And Jesus, Jesus refers to this story. He says, you remember the story when, when Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness? And, he, and, and he, yes. And he said, the son of man is going to be lifted up. What is he saying? He's saying that I am the way not only for sins to be forgiven, but for people to be healed so that they can recover from the brokenness and infection that sin has caused in their life. It's one of the most amazing stories. This is what he says. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you are Israel's teacher. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one whom came from heaven, the Son of Man, just as Moses lifted up the snakes in the wilderness. So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life, that everyone who looks may live. For God so loved the world, just before the most famous verse in all of Scripture, he talks about the serpent in the wilderness. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. He was struggling to understand, but Jesus made things clearer when he talked about this strange story from the Old Testament. And the answer is to look 
and live. You can't earn it. You can't accuse or blame your way into justifying what you should have. You just start believing. What are we to look at? Look at the Jesus who was falsely accused. Look at Jesus who was found guilty of crimes he never committed. Look at Jesus who was stripped and beaten out in the open in front of everyone to make an example out of him. Look at Jesus who was nailed hand and foot to a cross. Look at Jesus who had that cross lifted up for all to see. Look at Jesus who refused to sin even when these horrible things were being done against him. And he asked God to forgive them. Look at Jesus who was buried. Look at Jesus who rose from the dead. Look and live. Look and live. It's not just forgiveness. It's the grace of healing. And the simple truth is that we all have not just memories of things that we wish we hadn't done or things we wish we had done. We also carry around a set of realities that seem to be embedded into our life and limit us in a lot of ways because of that. Some of us can't open ourselves up into relationships because of relationships that we have been in. Some of us can't look our spouse straight in the eye because of things that we have done because we were impatient or we were bored. Some of us are dealing with the consequences of our actions and it comes out of our check every single week or it limits our capacity to get certain kinds of jobs and, and we're frustrated by it and it would be so easy, so easy. It's always easier just to find someone to blame and what God says, take responsibility, just repent. Look to Jesus. You're not going to earn it, and we certainly don't deserve it, but how many are glad that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and that if we put our faith in him, we have everlasting life. Is that not good news? Is that not good news? So Father, help us to climb down from our position where we feel justified in our complaints. Help us engage in the kind of repentance that not only brings forgiveness of our sins, but healing from the consequences of those sins. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, let's all stand together.